Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm hoping there's quite a few people watching. This is very exciting. I'm Paul Woodadge, as usual. This is World War II TV, and we are streaming live from Operation Market Garden 76 years on. And it's all going to be very exciting. And the one thing we're not going to talk about is all the big higher level, operational level of who who got what wrong, and is it Urquhart, is it Gavin, is it this? We're not going to do that. We're going to simply follow one story of one small part of the um, First Airborne Division's assault on Arnhem. And in order to do this, because I'm in Normandy, I'm not in Arnhem. I'd love to be in Arnhem, but with everything else and COVID and travel, and it's I'm not there. So on the ground, I have two, I mean, the dream team couldn't have asked for two better historians to explain the events of the day. So um, in Wolfhazer is Joe Hook. Good afternoon, Joe. Are you Hello. excited? Hello. And on the uh, drop zone is Edwin Popkin. Are you there, Edwin? Are you happy? Are you good? Yes, uh, Paul. I actually just dropped in, so I couldn't be better. Yeah, have you packed your parachute up? You know, everything ready? Uh, no, I just left it. Got a little bit of a uh, piece out for a scarf. But uh, for the rest of it, I just leave it there. Well, we'll we'll pack that up later. So, um, <laughs> so the story we're doing. Uh, well, I'm basically this is a show that's going to be easy for me because I'm going to hand over to the two people on the ground because they're there and I'm not. I will just add at the beginning that this is one of the stories that I'm particularly um, excited by. Years ago, when I first went to Arnhem, it was always following the first airborne reconnaissance squadron that that got me interested in this. I was an me associate member of the Veterans Association for a long time. And uh, I was last at the locations the, the guys are at last November. So uh, I, I went there last year. But I'm going to hand over to, to, to Joe and Edwin to, um, to set the scene and explain what's going on. So um, whichever one he wants, you, if you want to take the floor first, Joe, I think let's, let's okay. start the story. OK, good afternoon, everyone from... Um virtually probably the same type of weather that airborne troops would have experienced on the 17th of September 1944. It started off a misty morning but gradually it became a clear bright day uh, as you see on the ground where we are now and uh, 17th of September 1944 in this vicinity around Wolfhazer uh, the local Dutch people, it's a Sunday, they've been to church and, you know, some of them are out for a Sunday afternoon stroll, family get together and what have you. And all of a sudden the sky darkens and at 12.40 p.m. on that uh, day, suddenly 180 men plus six officers of the um, Pathfinder section would drop out of the sky and their job literally is to mark out DZs, drop zones for paratroopers, and LZs, landing zones for gliders, for the incoming lift on the 17th of September. Now, the first uh, people in are the gliders and the glider pilots, and they will, the initial first drop at about one o'clock that day is on uh, landing zone uh, S, which is just to the east of where you see the camera panning round. 19 minutes later, uh, you will see um, if we can look at the camera where Edwin is uh, shooting up at, up at LZZ. There you see the road there and across the road, that is LZZ. And it was here that the um, recce squadron's jeeps would land in gliders, having taken off from Tarrant Rushton that morning. By about 40 minutes later, the paratroopers start arriving. Um, and they will start arriving at 13.50 on that afternoon, dropping on the DZ that you see in uh, as the camera pans around, that's DZ X-ray. And this would be contain uh, paratroopers from the first, second and third uh, battalions, but also the recce squadron, the recce squadron uh, dropping as near to their RV site as possible and where the camera is being filmed on is the actual RV point where they would rendezvous prior to making their dash to the bridge. In the planning phases of Operation Market Garden, the three parachute battalions would each separately run parallel to each other to try and reach Arnhem Bridge. But also part of the plan was this coup de main dash by the, recce, uh, by the recce squadron to try and race to the bridge as quickly as they possibly could and hold it to await uh, the incoming parachute battalions. 
And as they dropped on that day, uh, there were very, very few casualties. It, they dropped completely. Um, it was somebody said, I can't remember who, what, which also said, but it was the cleanest drop of the war. They dropped um, and literally at first, they had very, very little or no resistance at all. So once the paratroopers were in and once the gliders had landed, each would separately separately go to their lot, allotted rendezvous spots. And the car park that you see just to the right of the screen there, um, just where the car is parked there, this was the rendezvous spot for uh, the first uh, recce squadron. Uh, now, each of the recce squadron had been allotted uh, their jeeps prior to the uh, operation. This would not would be normal. You'd be allotted where you were sitting, who you were going with in your in your jeep. And we're specifically looking at C Troop. Now, C Troop consists of seven, eight, and nine sections. Uh, and the one section we're really going to be looking in depth at to is section uh, eight section, led by uh, a guy called Peter Bucknell. Now, when the uh, paratroopers have dropped on DZX and the uh, gliders have landed on DZZ, uh, there is initially some time to marry up jeeps with the, the paratroopers, to marry them up together. Uh, seven and nine section get together quite quickly and they start their race off. Left, waiting on the road, that you see here in front of you is Peter Bucknell. And he's anxious to get going, but there is a delay with the Jeeps getting started, uh, get, getting together with their crew. And it, all the time, this must have been pressing on Peter Bucknell's mind because he knows seven and nine troop have already gone. And he knows that if he has to wait any longer, this is gonna cause a delay. And so what happens is he will get into, he, he takes the first Jeep that comes along. Now, his wireless operator is a guy called Arthur Barlow. And Arthur Barlow, unbeknownst to him, uh, Peter Bucknell will probably save his life that day because he instructs Arthur Barlow to wait for the other Jeeps arriving. And um, Peter Bucknell grabs troopers Gorringe, Rummel and Goulding. And together they race off uh, to try and catch up with men of 7th and 9th sections. And you can see the road down which, they, which they've raced. Meanwhile, still waiting for the Jeeps um, is Sergeant McGregor, Corporal Thomas, Arthur Bar Troopers, Barlow, Pierce, Minns and Hasler. Now that's gonna be six on a Jeep where normally you would have four, but Peter Bucknell's grabbed three and he starts racing off uh, to the bridge. So in a minute, you will see uh, that the camera will Obviously, we've got our own little Jeep there. It's a white little Jeep. So the camera is going to follow that race. And literally, just as um, the next Jeep comes up, which has the wireless set in it, Arthur Barlow was uh, uh, Bucknell's wireless operator. Just as the next Jeep comes up, they all pile into it and they see the sort of tail end of Bucknell's Jeep disappear. And it disappears around a very sharp, right hand bend in the road. All this time, there is no enemy resistance whatsoever. So you can see this is the same route as the recce squadron drove on that fateful afternoon. And really the whole action is over in about an hour. Um, but you'll see they come to a very sharp bend where the bend, where the road bends round to the right in a second. And it runs parallel to the railway line. And you can imagine Peter Bucknell is now, um, he's now caught up with seven and nine troop. And to, to have maximum operational efficiency, what they do is they leapfrog through each other. So there's the sharp bend that uh, Edwin has just driven round. And how now he's driving towards the Wolfhazer crossroads. And just before you get to the crossroads at Wolfhazer, that is when um, I think it's Sergeant Bowles, the name escapes me, but I think it's Sergeant Bowles. He pulls from seven section, he pulls his Jeep over to the side of the road, um, seven, se seven section, nine section pull over to the other side of the road, almost sort of like acting as a gateway 
for then Bucknell and eighth section literally to leapfrog through. And once they've leapfrogged through uh, that particular position, they will go across uh, the Wolfhazer crossroads, uh, the, the railway crossing, and then almost immediately turn right uh, down a road called Johannahove. And down that uh, road, Johannahove, it, there's a track. And this track runs parallel with the railway line and it will eventually uh, lead into open heathland. So as you can see at the moment, it's quite a distance, it's about two miles, but just about this point here, round by where the asylum is, you've got um, Sergeant Bowles pulls his Jeep over seven section to allow Peter Bucknell to go racing through. And he literally does race through, anxious to be on the bridge. They need to be on the bridge uh, before the men of the parachute battalions get there. I'm just going to interrupt you for a second, Joe, just because okay. I haven't talked for ages. And um, but for people watching that, we, we just, you know, nip in the bud, the, the myth from a bridge too far that the, the recce jeeps didn't arrive. I mean, that they did arrive and a lot of them are heading off of their objectives. So I just wanted to add that thought, that thought to the to the show so far and also that this leapfrogging tactic is standard practice whether you're yes. using infantry battalions or anything you know one up front two overtake one that's yeah. normal so there's the junction there and I'll, I'll hand back to you and i'm really enjoying this because i'm sure people are watching it because i'm enjoying it okay well um i can see at the junction the thing that's happened which we didn't want to happen was there's a train going and i was talking to paul prior to this they wouldn't have had that problem because on the 17th of september the dutch railways had gone on strike and funnily enough just before we started uh this the, the filming we were talking maybe we should ring up the dutch railways in the hope that they might go on strike so we wouldn't get caught at the level crossing well while but they were waiting i've just i've just phoned up the map there joe just so people uh watching know where we are so we started over yeah. here at the rv if Correct. you're following my Correct. mouse and then they're moving along here and they're just doing the junction here in Wolfhazer. Mm -hmm. and there's the road we're talking about the track that runs north yeah. of the railway line heading east towards arnhem there yeah. i mean i know we know it but there are some people watching and yeah. not be familiar so i i thought i'd show that while we've got the um Okay, and I, I think you should have another map with you because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, pan my camera around um, so you can probably see my camera because while Edwin's moving, it might be a good idea to talk about idea. what yeah. Germans there were in the woods. So there were uh, a, a German battalion here. It was the Crafts under the command of a guy called Kraft, uh, the 16th SS training battalion. It was under strength at the time, only about 435 men, but Kraft immediately, immediately the, 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 the paratroopers start dropping, he immediately recognises that they are going to be racing for the bridge. And so using really good initiative, he sets out three of his companies. So he uses, he's, he's in the vicinity of Wolfhazer. Uh, that's where his headquarters are. You see on the map, you can see Wolfhazer just to the left. His headquarters are in what is now a hotel. And so he immediately sends out orders for two company to maintain his left-hand flank and for four company to maintain his right-hand flank. And then he's so concerned about his right-hand flank, the top of his right-hand flank, he orders his reserved platoon to um, protect the right-hand flank of four company. And so effectively what you're having, and I'm panning the camera around here, you can see the heath here. Uh, there's a lot more foliage here than there was in the Second World War, but where you see the tree line up there is a hill. Not a great big hill, but enough for Germans to dig in up there. And there's actual foxholes that you can see or slit trenches, uh, whichever uh, military, British or American you are, there's foxholes up there. He also um, ensures that his men are dug in along the railway embankment. And you can see the railway embankment. Uh, you probably can just see the sun is uh, getting in a little bit in the, the way, but you can probably just see the culvert there, which is quite iconic towards the battle anyway. And when Bucknell came down this uh, track, there was, it was far, far much more of a slope than you see today. So if you could just shove up that picture again that you, you put up um, before, Paul, that would be great. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
So you can see it's, it's quite, it is quite a slope. I mean, you're looking, this is looking at it from the British perspective. Yeah. And then I think we've also sent you a picture that shows it from the German perspective. Yeah. So you can see that it is much more of a dip than it is today. Um, it was effectively leveled out when the motorway was put in, but you can see there's a distinct slope and that is the German perspective. So if you just keep that um, picture there, Paul, that is the kind of almost the same view uh, taken from the German perspective. And uh, Kraft had his men dug in up here and he knew this granite. Kraft had been here since 1942. So he knew the roads and it immediately, this was his northernmost point though. So he he immediately knew that he would put his troops out to cover this area here. And also down to if we, if we were directly as the crow flies, if we were to keep walking we would hit the Utrecht Veg, which runs straight from Utrecht into Arnhem and his men were deployed down there as well. They weren't deployed as far down as where second parachute battalion were but again that's an, uh, another conversation for another day but Peter Bucknell races uh, through here and as he comes literally um, where you see that you can probably see, just see the, the motorway bridge there. Can you see it in the distance? Can you see that there, Paul? Yep. You can just see the traffic. Just past. Yep. Yep. Yeah, just literally as he gets to the railway, uh, the, the, where the railway bridge is now today, the Germans open up, up on him and kill all, three, all, all four of the Jeep's occupants. And what is happening is at the same time, Arthur Barlow um, and uh, Sergeant McGregor are just hitting this point here where we're stood today. They are just, you can see, Edwin has now got over the uh, crossroads and he's now coming down the track that the uh, recce squadron would have come down. So we've already lost four of the recce squadron. That's uh, Bucknell, Gorringe and uh, Brummel and Goulding. And if you think Arthur Barlow would have been in Gorringe's place, so that's why I say Peter Bucknell unwittingly saved Arthur Barlow's life. The next Jeep comes into the dip that you see uh, directly in front of me and immediately the Germans open up on them and Hasler is driving. He, um, Mins tumbles out of the uh, Jeep and deploy the, the Jeep stops and they all get out to the right hand side uh, getting out is Arthur Barlow, uh, Mackay and Pierce. And on the left-hand side is the other four troopers. So that's Hasler, uh, Mins, um, can't forget the names off the top of my head, but they deploy out, out of the, the jeeps. And this firefight goes on for about 30 minutes or so. All of them are wounded. Mins is on the ground having been, ha having been shot in the hip and he's bleeding profusely. He's calling for help. McGregor lifts himself up onto his haunches literally to see what's happening and immediately gets shot and killed instantaneously. Arthur Barlow probably had luck on his side that day because although he gets hit in the thigh, he also, a bullet ricochets off the cocking handle of his Sten gun. And although he's wounded, that might or probably have saved him. So almost immediately, you've got the whole of that section that is um, that it is literally out of the picture. Um, and you still, at the same time, you still got the parachute battalions racing for the bridge, but they can't really, um, they're gonna be a lot more slower than the recce squadron. Following up though, eight section are seven and nine sections. And seven section comes into the fray um, and literally what they're doing is they're trying to extricate the wounded. Uh, one of the sergeants from se seven section, he goes forward, Sergeant Mackay, um, and he, he gets hit. They try to extricate him, but he's literally too large to lift out of the position. Nine section, who, when all this is going on, they're on the other side of the railway embankment. They get pulled back and told to go through to um, eight, uh, to go and help eight section and also seven section. And so they get within about 50 meters of um, seven section and decide 
to throw down smoke to try and give themselves a bit of cover. And uh, one or two of the troopers of Nine Section, I think, Paul, you're going to talk about one, Chandler, um, and you have a photograph of him. I do. But also, uh, we're going to then, I think we're going to come back and talk about Edmund. Edmund. So I'm just going to hand you over um, to Paul to talk about Chandler. Well, thank you very much. And that, that was riveting stuff, and I enjoyed it. So, yeah, as I said earlier, I've always been interested in, in the Airborne Reconnaissance Squadron. And... Uh, about 10 years ago, I wasn't even looking for anything. I was on eBay looking for books. And I was looking for a copy of Remember Arnhem, the book about First Airborne Recce by John Farley, Fairley. And I'd had an, a copy originally, but I, in the old way, as we historians know, I'd lend it to someone, didn't get it back. So I saw a copy on eBay for it for sale. And it was this copy here, if you can see that. But it didn't just come with the book. It came with a collection of stuff owned by one William Chandler. And you can see in the front of the book here, it's signed by John Fairley to Bill Chandler, First Airborne Reconnaissance Squadron, uh, 1979. And Bill Chandler was one of the guys who contributed to the um, Cornelius Ryan interviews for A Bridge Too Far. So you can download his interview off the Ohio University. I did it this morning, in fact, there. So I acquired William Chandler's diary, his medals, his beret. And um, he actually referred this incident in his diary, which is a diary he wrote um, in the off flag, he was captured. I'll let I'll hand back to Joe in a minute to carry on the story. But this is his the diary, he, a wartime log he was given by the Red Cross while he was an off flag. And um, I'll just read it. It's a very, very short extract about that day. And bear with me to put my glasses on to read this bit. In fact, I'll put it on Edwin's images so that I, so that we can see something while I'm reading. So this is what he says. He said, um, "I will write of the events, the bloody events which took place." Firstly, the landing part of the operation was magnificent and it was cushy. Some ak -ak, uh, slightly. This was the first day. I had reports from my comrades that it was more hotter on the following two days. I was wounded middle of the afternoon that first day and hit four times, bullet through the ear and three in the back. So that's his entire reference to the, the battle. Then it's all about his ordeal in the prisoner of war camp and his morale plummets. And he writes all these very... um angsty poems about being abandoned and this that and the other which you can completely get um and um this is his medal uh, medals here which i could have polished up but the thing is they're all, all mounted up and they're very difficult to polish so i've just left them as he had them um i thought you might seem to like seeing that that's pretty cool um so um i'm gonna hand it back to uh, joe and i'll show i'll show william chandler's photo and there he, there he is. He was actually in um, the parachute regiment first and then moved to Airborne Recce. I don't know exactly when, but he moved to Airborne Recce. And I'll show the, uh, the insert of the, um, the diary. So there is the section there where it says in his very neat writing, they're taken prisoner at Arnhem, Holland, 1944. And he does various sketches and things. And if anyone is interested in a copy of this, I've got all of the diary on a PDF. So just email me. I'll send it to you. I, I've sent it to a couple of authors over the years, and um, I'm always of the opinion that this kind of history should be shared, even though there's not that much about Arnhem. He does have at the back of the diary all these um, addresses of his friends and other people he met along the way. So that's my personal interest. And, um, you know, all acquired because I ended up buying a better copy of a book. So I'm going to hand it back to, uh, to, to, to Joe and Edwin to, to well, well, Edwin, what do you, well, it's obvious what we're looking at, Edwin. I'll, I'll, I'll unmute you. What that's obviously the slit trenches from on the German side there, Joe, uh, Edwin. So, um, yes, it's always, it's always a little bit questionable whether these are actual slit trenches or whether they've been dug out by other people, uh, reenactors or other people, uh, 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 after the war. But it is uh, basically the same hill that the Germans were dug in on. As you can see a little bit, if I'm panning a little bit, you can see the uh, hill moving down onto the open ground. And just across there, you will see the tree line where, uh, uh, where the uh, set, number seven section uh, 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 got to, uh, while number eight section, you know, McGregor was about uh, just a little bit up there in front. If I just move a little bit over here, you can see Joe in the distance. She is at the site where McGregor, uh, McGregor's Jeep uh, was uh, uh, was uh, taken out. And if I move even more to the left, well, I have to do a little bit of a walkabout here. We can get a little bit closer. 
to the. Well, is that only but, fair that you're doing all the clambering around and letting the ladies stand there and just, <laughs> just do the professional job? I think that's all very, all chivalrous? very proper. I think, yeah, you am go and get chivalrous? dirty while the professional tour guide actually does the history. That's the way it should be, Edwin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> so, I'm just playing. Um, I, I mean, know, it's, it's I a, know. you can see that it's an amazing ambush position, and when you think, and I'll ask oh, Joe is. to respond to this as well. Oh, you know, at this yeah. point, you know, so short after the jump, it's really bad luck to get into an ambush this quickly. You know, if yeah. it had been a day later, but it's yeah. really bad luck they ran into that because yeah. you know, it, it, it set into motion this, you know, lots of other things. And, mm -hmm. you know, sad for the squadron, but sca sad for the yeah. greater plan to, to, to yeah. take Arnhem. Or, so. or even if they'd taken a more northerly route. So yeah. they've taken a more northerly route because uh, what we know is Crofts uh, didn't have enough men to deploy them onto the Ada uh, and uh, the, oh, what's the road called? The, the, the road that runs through to Ada that you go to Ginkgo. Amsterdam Amsterdam yeah. And Amsterdamsveg, yeah. Um, so if they'd possibly taken that route, um, uh -huh. yeah. A what if? I well, suppose. operation yeah. market is full of um, if only they'd done that. <laughs> if only yeah. they'd done that. That is, we we analyse the ones that don't go so well, and the ones that go well, what they do go well, like you know, Overlord. We don't we don't you know dissect it in quite the same way. But we all, um, we all love a disaster, don't we? Well, we do, yeah. And you know, the last few days, as <laughs> usual, around the anniversary, Twitter and Facebook are full of the the debate. Some old, some new, <laughs> and it gets very heated sometimes. But what I wanted to do with my first Market Garden show, which you have um, ably done for me, is just present one small story on the ground yep. and just talk about the men involved and, and leave the discussion of the bigger picture to those who want to talk about that. Because, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's no, as we said in our in our practice, for this, there's no, you know, it's just not everybody didn't have a good day. Lots of commanders had a bad day at the office. But these sort of ground actions are exactly what I try and do at World War TV. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for you doing it. So let, let's go back to the story in the aftermath of what happened. I mean, Chandler was in that in the, the, the section that came up and he saw the wounded well, dead men and wounded men and he got captured. And I mean, as you said earlier on, Joe, this this whole action was over really pretty quickly. wasn't Yeah, it, it was really it was a really quick action. I mean, the initial um, uh, action with eight section was over in 30 minutes, literally, um, because they were outnumbered, outgunned. Um, they were virtually all injured. Um, and the same thing was happening with the sections coming back. So seven section was attacked. Um, and I think I mentioned Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Stacy. He was, um, he was put out of action. Uh, nine section then uh, follow through they, they come through seven section trying to use smoke but again they are literally denied access through on this this pathway because as you said it is a classic ambush I mean they had the 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 benefit of the high ground from you can see the embankment there um, and uh, like like we said there wasn't as much foliage but both sides they had the benefit of this uh, high ground one of the stories that um, possibly I wanted to focus on to end uh, this uh, interview about Market Garden is that of Trooper Edmonds. And I think we sent you a photo, Paul, and it's yep. quite an iconic um, picture from Operation Market Garden. Um, and there is, uh, I think his name's Ron, I can't remember, Ron Hill, it might think, I think that's Ron Hill, at the, at the graveside of Trooper Edmonds. Now, Trooper Edmonds was shot in the back, but it literally went through his lung. Um, and they managed, uh, Le Lieutenant Bowles and Sergeant uh, Christie managed to get him onto a Jeep and onto a, ch a stretcher in front of his Jeep. And they took him to the regimental aid post, which was at, at Wolf Hazer. And <clears throat> He was still alive at this time. And he called Sergeant Christie jock. So I'm assuming Sergeant Christie was Scottish, but uh, he, he knew he was dying and he asked for water. He got water. And he said to Sergeant Christie, he said, jock, I'm dying. Tell my wife, I love her and go and see, for, and go and see her for me. He lost consciousness uh, and later died of his wounds. And he died on the 17th of September, 1944, aged 27 years. Um, and unfortunately this year, you've just put up a picture. Can you go back to that picture, please, Paul? Of course I can. Anything you say, Joe, I'm loving it. Thank you. Um, because you've just put on a picture of a friend who was very dear to me, who died 
uh, not that long ago. This is Will. I used to call her Little Will. Um, and I've known her ever since I started guiding at Market Garden. And she was one of the very first flower girls here, um, which is a tradition that's carried on every single year. And it's not stopping because of COVID this year. There is going to be some sort of commemoration up at the cemetery uh, this year. And the flower children are still going to come in and lay their flowers. We hope, fingers crossed. Um, but I don't think what is happening, the media here are not sort of like, um, releasing a lot of information because of COVID and the build-up of people here. So uh, we were just lucky enough to see them marking out the graves the other day when we were at the Oosterbeek Cemetery. But if you go to the cemetery today, which is uh, just a little short drive away, you will be able to see um, those of the reconnaissance squadron who were killed in that, um, in that initial attack. And to kind of bring this story uh, round to uh, a conclusion. There was an, un an unknown soldier from the recce squadron was buried in Oosterbeek Cemetery. And Arthur Barlow managed to convince the Commonwealth War Graves Commission that that trooper was Ted Cor Gorringe. So if you remember, I said Peter Bucknell had pulled, told Arthur Barlow to wait for the other Jeep and he'd taken Gorringe with him. And um, because of his word and the evidence that was found, Trooper Gorringe now has his name on a grave at the Oosterbeek Cemetery. And I love that, the fact that we're still adding and we're still changing things and we're making amendments and to our history. And uh, just on the YouTube comments, there's lots of little conversations going on. Arnhem Descent, he, his theory is, is that those slit trenches were, the, were dug out for a documentary made by the Dutch a few years ago, which is distinctly possible. Um, obviously, that is the hill where the Germans were. But as, as Edwin, you said, you know, we're uncertain of whether they are original or not. You get the same thing in Baston and the Foxholes there. Yeah. But the point is, they do give that idea of, of, the, of the defensive position and, and what a view they had. And I'll just throw up the, um, the, uh, the view again, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the British view of the, of, the, of the movement down, because although in this photo, there's probably more foliage there, it does show you with the height of the railway line, the height of yeah. the high ground at the back. It was a you know, it's a it's it's a trap. It's a it's a disaster waiting to happen. Although, as we said, it was very unfortunate that the Germans were there so early, really, given that, you know, the jump had been so comparatively recent. But um, I'm glad you put it on yourself. Joe, so we can thank you for what you're doing and we'll stand up looking as well. And um, it's been a great little show. I've really enjoyed that. And um, I wanted to get, you know, keep it short and tight and professional and just cover that one story. And, and you did amazingly well, you two. So um, not that I was surprised. I knew you'd be amazingly good, but that is, you know, a, a great, a great little show. So um, thank you, you two. I mean, anything else you want to say about this in, in terms um, of conclusions? I just hope we're all here under normal circumstances next year, because it's really strange being out here. All the airborne flags are out and, uh, you know, the local Dutch people, there's a few Dutch people out who are commemorating. We saw a couple of Jeeps today, but it's just really strange. It's... Um, yeah, a bit anticlimactic, if that makes sense. But um, but it's been fun. And I don't want to say fun. It's been good being out here um, to remember them. So we're probably well, going to uh, go to the cemetery uh, later. As, as you and... said, in, when we had the practice, I mean, the only, the only positive of things like the COVID is that things like History Hack with Alina and Alex have started out my little TV live streams. There's been people have been clever enough to have initiatives to bring the battlefields to people in different ways and maybe that's the a future is where we can go to sites because there's also people who can't get to sites that's the thing yeah your guide like me we're all guides here and the, the, the reality is some people can't travel some people don't have the funds to travel yeah. or they or they, they have uh, you know physical issues this kind of thing brings it to anybody's living room wherever they are so I, i'd like to think there's some 15 year old school kid watching this in wyoming or something who's now got an interest in first airborne record they didn't have before we did have the question of course about how did freddie goff the commander of course the first airborne record get it to the bridge and the simple answer is he went a different way that's the uh, say again uh, how did Freddie Goff get to the bridge? And the answer is, of course, he went a different right way. That's the simple yeah, answer, well, isn't it? Well, yeah. basically, yeah, basically, Urquhart um, had gone to find Freddie Goff. So he'd cut, Urquhart had come up to Wolfhazer to find Freddie Goff. Freddie Goff wasn't there. And so he'd have left a message for Freddie Goff to come and find him. So Goff had gone to find Urquhart and got entrapped with, um, at the tail end of... Uh, um, third parachute battalion and what have you and and goff 
eventually managed to wend his way down and got ensconced with second parachute battalion and the uh, headquarters element and ended up on the bridge. So when the fighting was go going on up here, Goff wasn't even in his, well, we don't think Goff was in his headquarters. He was elsewhere looking for Urquhart. Indeed. So, and, 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 and I think a lot of people don't even know Freddie Goff's name. If you've read about the Recce Squash, and of course he's famous, but, you know, I think a lot of people who read about the bridge, I think Freddie Goff doesn't kind of come into the conversation sometimes because he's, he's Recce, not, not Parachute Battalion. But anyway, that's another subject another day. I'm already getting requests saying we should do more stuff with you people and you should do stuff from Oosterbeek and Arnhem. So, you know, if you... If you want to come back and put something together tomorrow, I'd be happy to do it. But you're obviously very busy. But this has been good. But have a think about it. If you want to do something else, we have, of course, got Edwin back and Joe helping out on the 19th with a show from Son, which is going to be about Hell's Highway and Americans and, and that side of it. But at the moment, this is our only um, British Market Garden show. But it doesn't mean it will be the last. There's next year. There's discussion panels we can have. There's all sorts of things. I just wanted to do something tight and get the ball rolling and do something for Market Garden. So that was an incredible job, you two. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, Edwin running about doing all the the, the, the the movement stuff and Joe and expert commentary. It was it was really perfect, exactly what I wanted, exactly what people wanted. So um, Thank you. brilliant. And you know, I, I'm just gonna end by saying bash on Recky and I'm gonna change hat. Max said I shouldn't do this. She said it was cheesy, but I think, you know, I should just put the Recky Corberry on um, I haven't worn that for about 16 years. That's the one I last wore on. And with Rich, Rich, Richard Fisher's watching this show, I was there with lots of... So I thought I'd just put that on for a second or two. If it's a bit cheesy, I do apologise, but I wasn't a member, a member of the association. So there we are. I haven't put that berry on my head for a long, long time. It's not... Um, I have got William Chandler's post-war ber beret. It's too small for me, and it's not the beret he had at Arnhem. It's one he got after he was liberated from the prison of war camp. The Germans by all accounts, nicked his berry off him. And just to finish William Chandler's story, he died in 1983, I think without any children. So he's only 61. I did, when I acquired that paperwork, try and find some members of his family, but I, I as yet haven't found anybody even to give them copies of it. So I, 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 it's, it's with me. So uh, where it'll go after me, I don't know. I'll give it out to a museum or something. But anyway, that was good. So um, thank you very much, guys. So World War II TV, please check out our Patreon page. Check out Edwin's touring page. Joe does tours. You can engage these people, hire them. They're both, well, Joe's on Twitter. Edwin's on Facebook. They're all there. Make contact with them. And um, Joe knows her stuff. And and um, it's, it's yeah, going, th th we talked about in the, the, the practice, Joe, a female coming and doing Arnhem tours amongst big burly paras 20 years ago. You had to earn your spurs then. And respect to you, Joe, for fighting through that, you know, that. Thank you. Swamp of, of, of sexism Maroon. frankly you know so but you're there and you clearly know your stuff and edwin knows your stuff so thank you very much everybody i'm going to end the stream i'll see you all again super and uh you won't see me this wearing this hat again so take advantage of it now i'm uh because i'm not doing it again so thank you very much folks cheers thank you very much bye. we'll see you again bye. on world war ii tv bye, -bye.